I've entitled the message, I and my Father are one. This is the Lord's declaration of himself. Who is Jesus Christ? Do you know if you know who he is, you're saved? All who are saved know who he is. All who are not saved do not really know who he is. If you know who he is, it's because you know him. Who is Jesus Christ? Well, he said, I and my father are one. If he is who he says he is, this is of infinite importance. If he's not who he says he is, this is of no importance. Amen? The one thing that cannot be said is this is of relative importance or moderate importance. I've said in the past the gospel of true is of infinite importance. If false, it's of no importance. But the one thing it cannot be is moderately or relatively important. Now he said in verse 30 of our text, I and my Father are one. Not very much alike. One. And they understood exactly what he was saying because we read in verse 31, then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. I mean, think of this. They picked up rocks and they were going to throw it at him, all of them in unison to kill him. That's what they thought of this statement. And the Lord said in verse 32, Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed you from my Father. For which of these works do you stone me? The Jews answered him, saying, For good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, because that thou, being a man, makest thyself God. That's what they were accusing him of. They heard exactly what he meant when he said, I and my father are one, he said to these people, I am God. Now, can you imagine their response? You are looking at God. He said in John chapter 14, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. He didn't say it's as if you had seen the Father. He said, he that hath seen me hath seen the Father. Look in verse 22 of John chapter 10. And it was at Jerusalem the feast of the dedication, and it was winter. Now, this detail John gives us tells us that there had elapsed some time between verse 21 and 22, uh, this feast of the dedication. And that's not talking about a feast that is uh, mentioned in the Old Testament, like the Passover feast or the Feast of Tabernacles. There are three main feasts. This is a different feast, and this is the only time this feast is mentioned. The Feast of Dedication is not found in the Old Testament scriptures, but it's what we get the word Hanukkah. For, is that the way you say it? Hanukkah? The Jewish Hanukkah? Okay, I said it wrong, sorry. Hanukkah. That's where this came from, and it came from um, about 150 A.D. when the Maccabees had a revolt against uh, this uh, person that had taken over Jerusalem, and this was a celebration because of this. Hanukkah. 
And this is what he's talking about. This is the only time this word is mentioned in the scriptures. But that lets us know that some time had elapsed between verses 21 and verse 22. It was at Jerusalem, the feast of the dedication, and it was winter. And Jesus walked in the temple in Solomon's porch. Verse 24, then came the Jews round about him. They encircled him at this time. I think what they were doing was trying to ensure that what happened in John 8 wouldn't take place again. Look in verse 59, John chapter 8, then took they up stones to cast at him, but Jesus hid himself and went out of the temple, going through the midst of them and so passed by. And they experienced this. They're getting ready to throw the rocks at him, and all of a sudden he's gone. He passes through the midst of them, and they didn't know what happened, so I guess they were thinking, we're not going to let this happen again. So they encircled him, thinking that they had him trapped. And look what they say to him in John chapter 10, verse 24. Then came the Jews round about him. They encircled him at this time. We're going to make sure he doesn't get away. And they said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be Christ, tell us plainly. How long are you going to hold us in suspense? We're seeking the truth. And you remain vague and ambiguous in your speech, surrounding him, encircling him. If you're the Christ, the promised Messiah, the Old Testament scriptures speaks of you, tell us plainly. We're tired of this vague, obscure, language that you're using, this speaking in code, this cryptic language, tell us plainly whether or not you are the Christ. I told you. I've been telling you for 30 years. I told you. You didn't believe, but I told you. And you believed not. Now, when you believe not, you hear the truth, and you say, I'm not believing that. That's what unbelief is. You choose to not believe. They heard what the Lord said for three years, and he said, you believed not. Verse 25, the works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me. Do you know he didn't even have to tell them who he was for them to see who he was? He did what only God can do. He controlled the weather. Can you imagine someone controlling the weather? They said, what manner of man is this that even the winds and the sea do obey him? In the previous chapter... He gave sight to a man that was born blind. Only God can do that. They witnessed him creating matter. That can't be reproduced in a laboratory. He created matter. He brought bread into existence that had not been in the universe before. He Suspended the law of physics. He walked on the water. Only God can do that. He did what only God could do when he raised the dead. None of these things can be replicated in a lab. My works bear witness of me. I don't even have to say who I am because my works prove who I am. I am God. I do what only God can do. God manifest in the flesh. No mere man can do these things. Now look what he says in verse 26. Remember he said, I told you. He always spake plainly. 
My works bear witness of who I am. And you believe not, verse 26, but you believe not because you are not of my sheep, as I said unto you. What a statement. He doesn't say you're not my sheep because you don't believe. He says you do not believe because you are not of my sheep. There are sheep and there are goats. A sheep never becomes a goat. And a goat never becomes a sheep. And he says to these people, the reason you do not believe is because you are not of my sheep. Now, this chapter had began in verse 1. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same as a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice. He calleth his own sheep by name and leads them out. And when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice, and a stranger will they not follow, but will flee from him, for they know not the voice of strangers. Now the picture is a sheep pen. All the shepherds would bring their sheep at night into this big sheep pen. There would be different flocks all in this sheep pen. And in the morning when the shepherd would come, he would call out his sheep. And guess what sheep would respond? The sheep that were his sheep. They knew his voice, and they would follow him. Who are the sheep? Well, he calls them my sheep. Look in verse 27 of John chapter 10. My sheep. Not everybody's a sheep. My sheep. What's the evidence of being a sheep? They hear my voice. I know them. And they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all. No man's able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. The sheep, listen to me, the sheep are the elect. They are the ones the Father gave to him. Look in verse 14. I'm I'm the good shepherd, know my sheep, and am known of mine as the Father knows me, even so know I the Father, and I lay down my life for the sheep. The sheep are those for whom Christ died. They are the elect, those the Father chose before time began to be saved. They are those for whom Jesus Christ died. That's who the sheep are. Would you turn to John 8 for just a moment? He said, you believe not because you're not of my sheep. Look what he said in verse 43 of John chapter 8 when he's speaking to those who did not believe, who were not his sheep. He said in John 8, 43, why do you not understand my speech even because you cannot hear my word? You lack the ability to hear my word we're totally dependent upon him to give us the grace to hear. And he says to them, you cannot hear my word. You are your father the devil, the lust of your father you will do. He was a murderer from the beginning and abode not in the truth because there's no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks of his own for he's a liar and the father of it. And because I tell you the truth, you believe me not. Which of you convinces me of sin? And if I say the truth, why do you not believe me? He that's of God heareth God's words. You therefore hear them not, because you are not of God. Now these are the words of the Lord. And he says the reason you don't hear, the reason you don't believe, is because you're not of my sheep. Look in verse 6 of John chapter 10. This parable spake Jesus unto them, but they understood not what things they were which he spake unto them. 
Then said Jesus unto them again, Verily, verily, I say unto you, I am the door of the sheep. That's who he's the door of. The sheep. All that ever came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep did not hear them. Now this is so important. When he says all that ever came before me, he's not talking about Isaiah and uh, Jeremiah. or He's not saying they were all thieves and robbers. The sheep didn't here before them. What he's saying is this. In this thing of salvation, if you think there's anything that comes before me, if there's something you think you need to do before you can be saved, all that is is a thief and a robber. A thief seeking to rob God of glory, a robber seeking to rob you of the only ground of assurance you are you could possibly have, which is me. All that ever came before me, they're nothing but thieves. And robbers. But the sheep didn't hear them. You see, there's something in a sheep that makes him know the voice of the shepherd. And he flees from the voice of salvation by works. Something you must do before God can do something for you. That is salvation by works. The sheep run from that. They do not hear. Back to John 10, 27. My sheep hear my voice. And I know them. Oh, the Lord knows his sheep. He said, before I formed you in the belly, I knew you. What a staggering thought. Whom he did foreknow. Them he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. How staggering. He knew me. Think of that crowd on Judgment Day that our Lord tells us of in Matthew 7. On that day, many shall say unto me, Lord, Lord, you know us. Don't you remember? We preached in your name. In your name, we cast out demons. We had works of power. In thy name have we not done many wonderful works. Then shall I profess unto them, Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. I never knew you. Now he knew exactly who they were. And he knew everything they did. But he's saying, I never loved you. I never knew you to worship my person. I never knew you to believe on me. My sheep know me, and I know them. Let's go on reading. And, verse 27, they follow me. Now, would you please listen to this real carefully? Usually when people are talking about this scripture, following Christ, what they think of is, walking in his steps, imitating him, and so on. And I want to walk in his steps. And I want to imitate him. And I want to be just like him. But what's the Lord saying? Because there, people, people use this. Well, you, the way you measure whether or not you're a believer is how well you're following Christ, how well you're stepping in his steps. Now listen to me. When he says, follow me, what do you do when you follow somebody? You look to him. You don't take your eyes off of them. You don't look down at your feet. You'll lose him if you do that. If you're looking at your walk, you're not going to follow him. You're looking at your feet. You don't look to the side to see how someone else is following. Compare yourself with them. Don't do that. Don't do that. Don't, don't think that way. You don't look behind you. You'll lose him for sure then. I'm looking behind to see if I can find... Think of something that will give me some evidence that God's done something for me. I'm looking behind. No, you look... To him alone right now all the time. That's what it is to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. You keep your eyes upon him. You look to him only. When you look to him only, that means he's all you have. You don't have anything else. He's all you have. He's all you want. He's all you need. My sheep. Hear my voice, 
I know them. And they follow me. Verse 28. And I give unto them eternal life. The reason that they have it is I gave it to them. I give unto them eternal life. Eternal life is not about the longevity of that life, although that's included. This is the life that never had a beginning and never had an ending because it's the life of Christ as my life before God. That's what eternal life is. It's his life is my life. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Now, this is a life that's eternal, isn't it? It never had a beginning. It'll never have an ending. And this speaks of the security of the believer, the quality of this life. I love when the Lord tells us what eternal life is. When you have his life as your life, this is life eternal that they might know thee, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. That is eternal life. Oh, the quality of that life. I've come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. And how abundant it is to have the life of Christ as my life before God. That is eternal life I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish you see if they could perish it wouldn't be eternal would it they shall never perish now if they could they would if you could fall away you would fall away and you know that but because they can't they won't I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. Now, how strong is the hand of the Lord Jesus Christ? Oh, his omnipotent hand. No one can pluck any of his sheep from his hand. That's how safe they are. That's how secure they are. My Father, verse 29, which gave them me. There's election. He gave them to the Lord Jesus Christ before time began. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all. Whatever you're thinking of, he's greater. <laughs> Infinitely greater. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all and no man's able to pluck them out of my father's hand that's how secure they are and then he makes this transcendent incredible statement with regard to himself and this is who he is he says I and my father are one Now, they knew what he meant by that when they picked up those rocks to throw at him, didn't they? They knew exactly what he meant. They made this accusation. You being a man are making yourself God. He didn't make himself God. <laughs> he is God. And they knew exactly what he was saying. I and my Father are one. Now, they'd already been confronted with this in John chapter 5, and we're going to go back to that in a moment. But I and my Father are one to this degree. Now, think of these words. I and my Father are one to this degree. He that has seen me hath seen the Father. If you've seen him, who he is, you have seen 
the living God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, he whom no man can see. All you're ever going to see of the Father is the Son. You believe that? All you'll ever see of the Father is the Son. I and my Father are one, one in essence, one in substance, one in attributes. Somebody says, well, explain to me what the essence of God is. I can't do that, but I know he is one with the Father. I know that because he, he, he that has seen me has seen the Father. Well, well, tell me about his substance. I can't tell you about his substance, but I know whatever his substance is, it's Jesus Christ. I know that. Um, one with the Father. Colossians chapter 2 verse 9 says, In him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead in a body. I love the opening verse of the Gospel of John. In the beginning was the Word. The was was before the beginning. In the beginning was the word and the word was with God as a distinct person. And the word was God. The same was eternally, infinitely was in the beginning with God. One in purpose. Because they're one in person. They're one in purpose. The one God in three distinct persons. Turn back to John chapter 5 for a moment. This is what they'd already been confronted with. Now they were upset about him, what they considered breaking the Sabbath. In John chapter 5, he did this on the Sabbath day. He, he healed a man on the Sabbath day. What crime? How could he do this? He couldn't be of God if he healed somebody miraculously on the Sabbath day. And the Lord says in verse 17, But Jesus answered them, My Father worketh hitherto, and I work. We're doing the same thing. His works are my works. My works are his works. Therefore, the Jews sought the more to kill him because not only had he broken the Sabbath, but he said also that God was his father, making himself equal with God. There's only one person who's equal with God. God. Equal with God. Verse 19, then answered Jesus and said unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you, the Son can do nothing of himself. I don't act independently. But what he seeth the Father do, what the Father does, I do. I do what I see him do. For what things soever he doeth, these also doeth the Son likewise. My works are the works of the Father. Verse 20, for the Father loveth the Son and showeth him all things that himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel for. As the Father raises up the dead. Now he's showing us here how he's one with the Father in power. Who's the only one who can raise the dead? Who is the only one that can raise the dead? Jesus Christ the Lord. And look what he says. For as the Father raises up the dead and quickens them, even so the Son quickens whom he will. Now he's one with the Father in power. He raises the dead. He's one with the Father in sovereignty. He said the Son quickens whom he will. The Lord Jesus Christ is the sovereign of the universe. What that means is me and you are in his hand. Do you realize that? You right now are in his hand and he can do with you whatsoever he is pleased to do. Now, there's only one thing 
there's an appropriate response to that. Lord, save me. Have mercy on me. Do something for me. I can't do anything for myself. I can't save myself. I'm in your hand. Would you be pleased to save me? That's the only appropriate response. If you have some kind of response, well, I have nothing I can do. If, I, if he's sovereign and I can't do anything, nothing I can No, that's, that's, that's fatalism. That's not a, a, an appropriate belief toward that. No, you say, Lord, say, if you're the sovereign of the universe, sovereign, sovereignly save me. Will my salvation for Christ's sake please do that? He's one with the Father in sovereignty. He's one in judgment. Look in verse 22. For the Father judgeth no man, but hath committed all judgment to the Son. Verse 30. I can of my own self do nothing as I hear I judge. And my judgment is just because I seek not mine own will, but the will of the Father which has sent me. Now, what that means is there's only one judge, and that's him. God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. Their judgment is the only judgment that counts. I don't want to be, uh, I want to be careful the way I say this, but I was at a baseball game last night, the UK game, and on almost every call that was a ball against a Kentucky player, I would hear screaming, that's not right, that's not right. I don't agree with that. Guess what? There's only one judgment that counts, that's the umpire. And there's only one judgment that counts. That's God's judgment. He says, I am the judge. My father is the judge. And my judgment is the only one that counts. What you think of me, I want you to think well of me. Don't think I'm indifferent about this. But what you think of me doesn't even count. What does he think of me? How does he judge me? What I think of you, it doesn't count. Are you one he sees in Christ? That's the only thing that counts. He is the only judge. They're one in honor. Look in verse 23. That all men, verse 23, that all men should honor the Son even as they honor the Father he that honoreth not the Son, honoreth not the Father which has sent him. If you don't give all honor to the Son as God, the God of glory, the creator, the sovereign of the universe, you don't honor the Father. If you don't honor the Son just like that, you don't honor the Father at all. They're one in independence. Look in verse 26. For as the Father hath life in himself... What does God need? Does he need you? No. Does he need anything for his happiness, for his existence? Me and you need food, water, sleep. Um, he's utterly independent. No needs. Somebody says, well, he saved us because he's lonely. No, he wasn't. Perfect fellowship between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit eternally. He has no needs. Verse 26, for as the Father hath life in himself, so hath he given the Son to have life in himself. The utter independence of the Lord Jesus Christ. They're one in authority. Look in verse 26 or 27. And hath given him authority to execute judgment because he is the Son of Man. Now, in light of who he is, I want to close. In light of who he is, he said, I and my Father are one. In saying that, he is saying, I am God. In light of who he is, number one, he is to be worshipped as God. Just like that leper did when he came and worshipped him, falling at his feet, saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me 
clean. That's worship. That's what the Bible says. That's what the Lord says in worship. Behold, a leper came and worshiped him. Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. Understand, because of who he is, one with the Father, that all sin is against him. Against thee, thee only, have I sinned. And done this evil in thy sight. My sin is against him. Can't you sin against somebody else? Well, I'm sure you can, ever to, but that's not what the Bible says. Against thee and thee only have I sinned. If he's one with the Father, that means he's the creator. Jesus Christ is the creator. He's the one who created the universe. That means he's controlling everything. Always has, always will. Whatever's taking place, he is in absolute control of, and he himself is salvation. I love what uh, Simeon said when he saw the baby, eight days old. He knew who he was. He saw the Lord's Christ. He knew exactly who he was. He said, Lord, now let us thou thy servant depart in peace, for mine eyes have seen thy salvation. Jesus Christ is God's salvation. Because of who he is, whatever he intended to do, he did. Because of who he is. You know, he's incapable of failure. You know, when people uh, preach that Jesus Christ could die for somebody and they wind up in hell anyway, all they prove by that is they don't know who he is. Because if you know who he is, you know he must be successful in whatever he intends to do. On the very opening pages of the New Testament, thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Did he do it? Did he do it? It is finished. My salvation was accomplished. Because of who he is, having his righteousness as my personal righteousness is having the righteousness of God as my personal righteousness. And let me tell you, my hand didn't have anything to do with this. There's a, my thumbprint is not on this righteousness anywhere. It's the righteousness of Jesus Christ as my righteousness before God. Oh, what a Savior. He's one with the Father. He is the only object of faith. Because of who he is, he's the only object of faith. Look unto me. That's Christ speaking. Look unto me. Nowhere else. Look unto me. Don't look at the preacher. Don't look at the church. Don't look at your experience. Look unto me. And be ye saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God. There's none like me. Now, I and my Father are one. Who Jesus Christ is is the content of saving faith. Let's take those two thieves. One knew who Christ was. The other didn't. And the one who knew who Christ was only knew because the Lord revealed himself to him. But he knew who it was hanging on the cross. That other thief died in his sins. He didn't know who he was. Saving faith is knowing who he is. If you know who he is, you will believe. No doubt in my mind about it. If you know who he is, you must believe. And if you do not believe, it's because you're clueless as to who he really 
is. Who is he that overcometh the world, but he that believeth that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? That, my dear friend, is saving faith. If you believe he's the Son of God, you trust him to save you. You believe in his ability to save you. Well, what did they do? They picked up stones to cast at him. But by his grace, we bow before him and confess who he is. There's no more glorious thing that we can say with regard to him than this. He is one with the Father. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, how we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ who is one with yourself. And Lord, we cannot believe except you give us the faith. And we ask for the gift of saving faith to believe on your son, to believe who he is and what he did as all in our salvation. Bless your word for Christ's sake. In his name we pray. Amen. Kate Hands is now going to confess Christ in believer's baptism. So we'll do that after the song. Come leads in him.